responsibly. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to rule the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The Lord is here. Invocation in unison. Our Father, let the light of your face shine upon us this morning. Though our hearts with joy created us a new sense of our responsibilities to serve you as we worship your faith. May our hope and confidence be centered in your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kim 839, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Jesus our Savior, whose triumph we want and eagerly 
awake. Amen. I announce the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven, but for the asking of our faith. <laughs> Christian preacher of the 
wall. Some wonderful things happened that day in spite of the fact a man was scared. And it's okay to be scared. What we have to do is just keep plowing ahead and never give up. Our Father, we thank you for these young people. Always bring them back to us in safety. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh Lord, each of us in our own way, bring before you our prayers and our concerns. Lord, so much continues to go on daily in life. And in you we do find our refuge and our strength. We find our hope. With open hearts, Lord, we come before you, praying for your intervention in all of the affairs of life, praying for your constant presence. For we are wise enough to know that no good ever will be accomplished apart from you. We pray that you will bring the nations together that no longer will they want to have war one with the other. We pray for the peace in the Ukraine, peace in the Middle East. We pray for tyrants to stop doing the horrible things they do daily. We pray your spirit will speak to them, giving hope and giving the ability to be righteous. We pray for the leaders of our nation. Give them your spirit. Deliver them from the temptations of greed. We pray that they truly make this society of ours a better place in which to live. Always we pray for our armed services, for all of the people who serve this country. Be with them and keep them safe on every assignment. May none be hurt. Protect our police, our fire department, our first responders who put their lives on the line every shift. Be with them and keep them safe. May none be hurt. We pray that you will heal the sick everywhere. We pray that you will give your spirit to people that they may be able to make important and tough decisions. Comfort the many who mourn and be with those who go through the valley of the shadow of death before this church worships again. We pray they have faith for eternity. And oh Lord, we love the church of Jesus Christ. We pray that you will bless the whole church, every church on the face of the earth. May churches do your will and may they take the loving, saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ to people in such a way to be accepted and believed. Bless us here at Adamsville, Lord. Give to us, Lord, the ability to be the church you would have us be. Fill our hearts with love and with the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that you be with the many who graduate in the coming weeks. Be there to give them direction and to give them hope. We pray that you will give them safety. And that all of our young people, as they enter into adulthood, have your protection and your strength. And all of this we ask in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hymn number 451, Open My Eyes. Thank <laughs> you.
Eric Seacrest, and uh, I sure hope we have a nice congregation to welcome him here next week. I'm going to be in Columbus, Ohio. I can't believe it. It seems like just yesterday my granddaughter Sophia was born, but now she's graduating from Capital University. And we're going down on Friday because she's receiving a distinguished service award and they're having a big dinner giving the, the award and graduations on Saturday and then we're having a big party at my son's home down there and I'll be coming back on Sunday. So at any rate, I'll be gone for the weekend and Rick Seacrest will be here to preach next week. We have a bill of uh, insert in the bullet and I hope each of you will read it and I hope you come. Uh, we are sponsoring a evening out up in Erie for an Erie Seawolves game. And um, it asks that you sign up for the event by May 15th, either through the website or by contacting one of our folks here. Um, we're going to give the tickets to people, and we're going to do that on the worship service on May 15th. And the game is, um, oh my gene, when is that game? The 21st. That's what I thought. And, uh, Anyway, it's going to be fun, and it's nice to be able to just go out and have fun as a church sometimes. So we will be doing that. These are our announcements. Let us continue with the morning worship.
Thank you very much, Mara. I appreciate it. First, I would read from Psalms, the 30th one, beginning with the fourth verse. This is Thanksgiving for Recovery from Illness. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, the joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved by your favor, O oh Lord. You had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And from the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as was his custom, going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see. So they led him away by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate. Or drink. The life of Saul is very dramatic. From his youth up, Saul was devoted to the study of Scripture. He was born a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the strictest sect of the Pharisees. He had many gifts. He was bright. He was talented. And his character was very important to him. He wanted to be faithful to the God of his fathers, to Yahweh, the God of Israel. He was sent into Jerusalem to study the sacred scriptures. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who was one of the greatest rabbis of the ancient world. In the Christian gospel, Saul saw only a blasphemous assault on the faith of the fathers. He saw Jesus as nothing more than a wicked imposter. Everywhere he spoke and acted against the Christian disciples. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. Scripture says that Stephen's garments were laid at the feet of Saul. Because of his zeal and because of his great energy, he became the chief persecutor of the first church. Having heard that the church in Damascus now had Christians, he was inflamed with anger. And he went there 
with authority to arrest and to drag into prison any person who confessed the name of Jesus. Saul's rage spared none. He was much like an inquisitor of a fanatical type. He was convinced that he was opposing a movement that was both dangerous and disastrous for the welfare of the people of Israel. He genuinely and honestly believed that those who said they followed Jesus were enemies of God. But now came a great change. As he approached the city of Damascus, he saw a great light. Saul fell helpless to the ground. And as he lay there, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the astonished Saul cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. To this, Saul answered, Lord, what will you have me do? And then he was told what to do. The people on the ground heard the wind, but they did not hear the voice or see the light. They did not get the message, and they did not understand what Saul had just gone through. And the account goes on to say that Saul got up and he was blind. He could see absolutely nothing. And then the story tells how he got his sight back. And he was baptized by Ananias. And he received the Holy Spirit of God. The account presupposes that Saul had been informed that he had been persecuting Jesus. And I suggest that this on a simpler level is true for many people who live in the modern age. I believe people live their lives fast and furious, and often they miss the effect that their actions have upon other people. Often human beings persecute Jesus without ever realizing that they are engaged in this awful activity. And we do this whenever it is that we refuse to love the very people who Jesus loved. Paul, or Saul experienced that day quite a transformation. He was to be a witness to Jesus Christ before the Gentiles and the kings and the people of Israel. Saul, who would become Paul, was to suffer great things for Christ. And all of this was in direct opposition to what he had been doing previously. Never was a human being more completely turned around than was Saul of Tarsus as he became the Apostle Paul. He was to build the church that originally he attempted to destroy. He was to spread the gospel that formerly he had detested. He was to love the very people he wanted to throw into prison. And I do believe that Saul became the greatest preacher of them all. And he asked that very important question. What will you have me do? And I would suggest that this is a good question for every single Christian on the faith of the earth to ask. In our best moments, all of us want to do the will of God. You know, there's nothing in life I don't pray about. I constantly pray about my family. I prayed for them as I was driving my automobile down to church this morning. I pray for my marriage. I pray for my job performance. I never get into the pulpit without saying, Lord, let what I say that is incorrect not be heard. And please, when I'm right, may the people hear it. And I think all people need to really strive to be honest with God. 
And one of the ways we do this is by simply asking the question, Lord, what would you have me do? And this also works when we are confronted with deep frustrations in life. When there's pain, when there's suffering, when there's bad news. Lord, in this situation, what will you have me do? Why is life the way it is? This is a question that the Apostle Paul, I believe, must have asked numerous times in his life. For he faced many frustrations and he faced denials all of his life. He had that thorn in the flesh that hounded him throughout his entire adult ministry. Three times in the Bible, he asked God to take away the pain. I'm certain that he wondered why he had that pain when his only goal in life was to go among all of the Christian communities and proclaim the word of God and bring new believers to the gospel. But his prayer that the thorn be taken away always was answered in the negative. The thorn never was removed. Paul learned that the thorn was God's final will for him, and it became a source of strength. When he was weak, he could cry out, I am strong. And for this reason, he could take pleasure in his pain and glory in it because he knew that wherever he was whatever he was doing the power of the Lord Jesus Christ rested upon him and upon his ministry of course the supreme illustration of doing God's will by submitting to it is the trust and love Jesus himself showed as he came to his own journey's end on this earth he taught us not only to pray, thy will be done, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out in the midst of the worst agony imaginable, Father, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And Jesus had to accept the cup, and he accepted it by dying on Calvary's cross. And I suggest that it is possible for each and every one of us to glorify and to serve God by simply submitting to the will of God. And what this does, and it's kind of nice, is it makes each of us co-workers with God. You see, Paul was on the wrong path, and he was doing the wrong thing, although he did not know it. And all of a sudden, he heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the important factor is that the moment he knew he was wrong, he did an about face and asked God what he should be doing. And I suggest whenever any of us find ourselves on the wrong path and God has made his plan plain to us, we must say, oh Lord, what would you have us do? And when we, as Saul, find the courage and the strength to make a mid-course correction, or will we simply blindly keep going on as we have before? There is one factor that stands out in all of this record of Paul's confession. It is that God wanted him to come to Christ. I've told you many times that I do not hold to that old Presbyterian doctrine of double predestination. This was the belief that all angels and people before the creation of the cosmos was predetermined by God to act in a particular way. I believe in free will. I believe I have the ability to obey God or to make the decision that I will reject God and turn and walk in the other direction. But my faith tells me that even though I have free will, God still ultimately wins. And to me, this makes God 
much bigger. I also believe that certain people God really wants cannot escape his call. And I believe Paul was just that person. Jesus Christ wanted Paul to begin the church in the Gentile community. And God's call was made in a very profound way. And Paul recognized it, accepted it, and then followed faithfully the Lord Jesus Christ. I do believe that God wants each of us to respond in faith to his call for us. God wants no one to perish. He needs people to come before him in repentance. And each of us always must ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? Paul became a Christian the moment he was baptized by Ananias. In that moment, his entire life was transformed and he was born from above. He experienced quite a new life. He found a new energy and a new power to live. Here we have the realm of the eternal intersecting with his life and giving to Saul a brand new outlook. Paul truly was zapped by God. He became a marvelous proclaimer of the Word of God. He was able to see the nature of love, and he talked about love, I believe, better than any other human being that ever lived. The 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the love chapter, is one of the most magnificent statements of love that ever was written. So far in my life, I've performed 994 marriages. I want to get that number up to 1,000. But I'll bet you in at least 970 of them, I've read the love portion from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul had an energy that was absolutely unbelievable. He took in his own life the attacks he previously directed against his religious enemies. Everything a fanatic could do was done against Paul. He was stoned and left for dead, he was robbed, he was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten five times with 40 stripes. He was endangered even by his own people. And he did this because of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ and because of his belief in his call. I hope none of us ever will go through this torment. And most likely our faith has come to us without divine intervention. Yet each of us know and we believe that our faith is real, it is true. And in this spirit, I want to suggest to you that all of us need to cry out, not just once, but daily. Lord, what will you have me do? And then to the best of our ability, we will do it. And let's close our worship service by singing hymn number 366. <clears throat>
everlasting.